switch slowly into our first uh, plenary lecture, which will be given by Stephen Strogatz, who is joining us online. And I'm not sure, we still have to see how this will work technically. Oh, there he is. Fantastic. Good okay. evening, Steve. Hi there, Sergey. Can you hear us? I, I hear you. Do you hear me? Ex excellent. Yes. Hello, Steve. Yes, As I'm hello. always saying that, hello, uh, welcome. Uh, we are from the future because here is Monday and uh, you are in the past, which is Sunday. So uh, excellent that it all seems to work very well. Uh, I will now uh, leave the floor and uh, the floor will be all yours. So please, uh, probably you have to share your screen. Here we go. How does it, does so, that look good? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we see everything and we also hear you. So uh, uh, the, uh, the plenary talks are all, this is also again a technical information for everyone, running for 45 minutes, which includes discussion and is sharp uh, because we have a tight schedule. So please try to uh, finish your talk, uh, depending on how many questions you expect uh, in a reasonable time, which I think might be something like 35 minutes or so. Uh, with this said, uh, let us uh, start our first uh, plenary uh, lecture given by Stephen Strogatz from uh, Cornell University, uh, and the talk is on global synchronization, new theorems, and new puzzles. Please, Steve. Thank you very much, Sergey. Good morning, everybody, and good evening, depending where you are. Well, yes, it's a great pleasure to be invited to this conference. I'm I'm delighted to be here with you virtually. So I'd like to talk about uh, some questions that I've been thinking about and several other people have been thinking about recently having to do with synchronization. So, of course, many different systems in nature can get themselves into sync spontaneously. Uh, let me begin with this example of neurons in the upper left picture. This is a special preparation where the neurons have been treated with a special kind of dye so that when they fire, you'll actually see them flashing almost as if they were fireflies. So if I were to click on my screen, take a look at the neurons, you can see many of them going off synchronously. Boom, they all flash in time in perfect sync. Um, this of course happens in, in our own bodies, in our heart. You have specialized cells in the pacemaker region of your heart, the sinoatrial node, where those cells need to discharge electrically in sync in order to trigger the rest of your heart to beat, to get your ventricles to pump blood and, and keep you alive. And of, of course, you don't have to be a living thing to synchronize in this way. You can have inanimate objects like laser arrays or the generators in the power grid uh, also exhibit very nice synchronization properties. So there's a, an enormous literature on self-synchronizing systems that's been around for, I don't know, must be, well, many decades, certainly going back to the 1960s, even earlier than that probably. And each of these systems that I'm showing here are, are quite complicated if you wanted to get the physics or the biology exactly right. And so in, in my talk, I don't want to do that. I wanna focus on very simple models, the thinking being that, that synchrony is very difficult to analyze mathematically, and even simple problems will turn out to be quite rich and complicated and fascinating dynamically. So just to understand why we're going to be resorting to simple models, let me point out some of the difficulties if we were to try to do things realistically, which is worth doing, and of course many people have done that. Um, Keep in mind that in order for synchronization to occur, the oscillators themselves have to be nonlinear oscillators. You don't see synchronization with linear systems, it just isn't possible by the superposition principle, you wouldn't have attractors. Um, so you need nonlinear oscillators. That means the equations will be hard to solve analytically. There are often two or more timescales involved in these kinds of oscillators. So you get into perturbation issues of, of having to cope with the multiple timescales. Sometimes there is non-smoothness, like in the case of neurons or heart cells, they have uh, spiky waveforms or other kinds of non-smoothness that can come in. 
Frequently, there are many variables required to describe even a single oscillator. So they have very high dimensional state spaces. Could be hundreds or thousands of variables to say to describe the state of a neuron. On top of that, there are many oscillators. I mentioned that in the, the sinoatrial node of the heart, you have something like 10,000 cells. So you've got many oscillators, many degrees of freedom per oscillator. They're also connected in some complicated ways. They may be connected in lattices or in networks. So there's a lot going on when we think about self-synchronizing systems. And to make progress mathematically, people have resorted to a number of simplifications. And I wanna focus here on, on what I think of as the, the one that has had the most influence um, on the field of nonlinear dynamics. It begins with the idea of a limit cycle oscillator. So just as a reminder, when you have a limit cycle, you have some sequence of states in your state space such that the, um, the state of the system moves around on some loop and is attracted to that loop in the sense that if you start near it, you will quickly spiral onto it or uh, also from the inside. So we have this attracting stable limit cycle that models a self-sustained oscillator like a heart cell um, or, or could be a laser in a certain regime. And so in the 1960s, uh, late 1960s, around 1967, Art Winfrey realized that in a certain perturbative limit, you could reduce a limit cycle oscillator, even having hundreds of state variables, to a much simpler model that would only have one state variable or, or only one effective variable, the phase describing the position around the limit cycle. If you have oscillators that are nearly identical and very weakly coupled, meaning that um, there's some small parameter that says that the, the uh, differences in the oscillators are small and the coupling is small compared to the strength of attraction to the limit cycle. In that regime, which is often a, a realistic regime, you know, Winfrey was able to make great progress both in computer simulations and analytically and discovered phenomena that looked like very much like thermodynamic phase transitions. He was seeing critical phenomena in these oscillator systems. Um, and this brought a number of statistical physicists into the study of what had begun as biological oscillator problems. And, and really the big breakthrough came in the mid 1970s when Yoshiki Kuramoto showed that the long-term dynamics of this class of systems, nearly identical, weakly coupled uh, limit cycle oscillators could universally be reduced to some phase model of this form. Here the variable theta is the phase of oscillator I. You could think of it as an angle, um, like for a point on the unit circle. And the time rate of change of this phase depends on a natural frequency, omega I. There's a single function, F, that um, is shared by all these oscillators because they are nearly identical at this order of perturbation theory. They're all governed by the same interaction function F. Notice it has no subscript on it. And there's also some coupling strengths, Kij, which encode the topology of who is interacting with who and how strongly. Um, now, even though this is an enormous simplification because you just have the one variable of phase per oscillator, it's actually still not simple enough in that, you know, you could have disorder in the frequencies. You could have a, a function F with many harmonics um, in its Fourier series. You could have arbitrary topology and coupling strength in the Kij. So there's still a lot of possibilities and people have been exploring these for now. Well, Kuramoto's work is 1975. So it's getting to be close to 50 years. <clears throat> now, um, there is one particular story here that has to do with the traditional Kuramoto model that I would be happy to talk about, but that's actually not the topic of my talk today. Instead, I want to focus on a very special case that I think you'll find interesting if you haven't thought about it before, which is networks of perfectly identical Kuramoto oscillators. Even though these are identical, there's still a lot going on because of network um, 
topology. So by identical, I mean, I'm gonna think of all the omegas as being equal to some single omega. So they have identical frequencies. The interaction function F is just gonna be our simplest possible periodic function, the sine function. Again, all oscillators have it. But the, the richness of the problem comes in this coupling topology. The Kij, I'm gonna to choose to equal just a big matrix of zeros and ones, where I'll put a one if the oscillators are connected and a zero otherwise. So this is what we would call the adjacency matrix for an undirected graph. And we're gonna consider arbitrary topologies here. And so the big question that I wanna focus on is how does the topology of a network of this kind affect its tendency to globally synchronize? So by globally synchronize, what I mean is there's just one attractor, all the oscillators in phase running at the same frequency, no other patterns possible. And so from all initial conditions, the system will end up in this state. If you're used to thinking in statistical physics terms, it's like saying that there's a global minimum of the energy landscape and uh, no other local minimum. So you may recognize that the model that I just wrote actually back uh, here looks very close to a, um, an XY magnet. If we were at zero temperature with all these omegas equal um, and the the F just being the sine function. This really is just an XY model at zero temperature, if you prefer to think of it that way. And so it's a question that's that's really on everybody's mind nowadays. I noticed that machine learning is a topic here at the conference. You know, in machine learning, it often comes up that when we're trying to tune parameters, um, we would like to know, is there a global minimum for the parameter setting in the energy landscape? Or can there be spurious minima that are not optimal, not, not the deepest minima? So here we're looking for conditions where there will just be one global minimum and no other local minima. What, what kinds of network topologies do that? That'll correspond to a, a global synchronizing oscillator network. So let me try to make it a little more visual for you. Think of color as representing phase, meaning point around the circle. So if I um, let this oscillator run. You see as it's running around through its different phases, this dot is changing its color. So I'm gonna use these colors to signify phase, um, taking advantage of the fact that the color wheel has the topology of a circle. And then you see in the panels below, I have two different, very different graph topologies. Here's a random graph, and I've started the phases uh, at random lots of different colors all over the place. Now watch carefully because this is gonna go by quickly. I'm going to let the Kuramoto dynamics run and let's see what happens to these um, random colors. All right, so look carefully. You see a lot of blinking and then very quickly, everybody is in phase. So this system has self-synchronized in that sense that now everyone is running at the same fre frequency and perfectly in phase. Now, there are other possible um, long-term dynamics if the topology is right. So here's a very simple topology, just a ring with nearest neighbor interactions, each oscillator only interacting with the one on either side of it. And if I arrange the phases in this way to go through a full circle of phase as I go around the physical ring, when I let that run, it will not go to perfect synchrony. Watch what it does makes a rotating wave. And that, that is stable. It will just keep rotating forever. So as you can see, here's another attractor that could, in some cases, compete with the everyone in phase attractor, the perfect synchronous attractor. Keep in mind also that waves of this type do exist in nature. This is not just an artifact of, of our simple mathematical model. Here's an example of fireflies in Japan where you can see waves of light propagating across the, the forest as the fireflies signal each other. So we certainly see plenty of instances of wave phenomena in coupled oscillator systems. And the question I wanna ask is, under what conditions is perfect synchrony more common than waves? And so an early case study in this direction was something that I did with my grad students at the time, Dan Wiley and Michelle Gervin back in 2006. Here you see one of these Kuramoto models on a network, identical omegas, sign interactions, but each oscillator 
uh, I is feeling oscillators J that are uh, within a distance K. So in other words, K nearest neighbors on either side. Here's an example in this picture of uh, say this oscillator is feeling its nearest neighbors as well as its second nearest neighbors. So this would be an example of K of two. And what I want to do is think of this number K, the range of the interaction as a kind of knob that I can turn a parameter that changes the range of the interaction. So K equals one would be nearest neighbor. K equals N over two would be a complete graph where everyone is interacting equally with everyone because it's uh, each oscillator feels half the network on say its right side and the other half of the network on its left side. So as I change this number K from one to N over two, we want to ask what's the probability that the system will go to synchrony if I choose random initial conditions. So we did a bunch of numerical experiments. Now, let me explain what you're seeing in this diagram from 2006. First of all, I'm showing three different systems of different sizes. So as the caption says, 80 oscillators or 60 or 40. We're looking at a different number of uh, nearest neighbors K. So over on this side, it would be nearest neighbor coupling, very local. All the way on this side, it would be um, essentially a complete graph, everyone coupled to everyone. And the graph has been normalized by N. I have not just K, but K divided by the system size N because that causes data collapse. All three examples of 80, 60, and 40 oscillators, all the data collapse onto what looks like a single curve. Now, the curve is showing the fraction of initial conditions that lead to perfect synchrony, starting from 100,000 random initial conditions. Okay, so I pick the 40 phases uniformly at random, let the system run, and then I ask what fraction of the time does everyone end up in sync? Down here, not very often. As you increase the range of the coupling, you're more and more likely to go to synchrony. And then at some point, it looks like the dots actually hit the line where there's a 100% chance of going to sync. Now we know there's actually a theorem that the complete graph always synchronizes. It doesn't have any other possible patterns. So this number is literally one. It's not asymptotically approaching one, it's, it's one. And actually all of these dots are one. 100,000 out of 100,000 initial conditions had trajectories that led to synchrony. This one, which looks like one, is actually 99.99%. There were exceptions. So somewhere between being coupled to 30% of your neighbors on one side and 35%, the system synchronizes 100% of the time. It globally synchronizes. Or to say it a different way, and this is the number I want you to keep in mind, when each oscillator is connected to the nearest, it turns out the number is about, this number should be about 0.34. When each one is connected to the nearest 68% of the other oscillators in the system, or more than 68%, the system always gets in sync spontaneously, or at least in the computer experiments, it did so every time out of 100,000 trials. Now, this is what I wanna generalize in the talk. Um, I wanna discuss this phenomenon. I mean, it's interesting. You didn't have to be fully connected to get perfect synchrony, just 68% connected to the rest of the ring was enough. So now let's consider the problem, not with the nearest neighbor coupling on a ring, but on any undirected graph, because what we're trying to do is understand the role of network topology on global synchronization. So here I've written down the same model, identical frequencies, except now I have an arbitrary coupling matrix, AIJ, one if they're connected, zero otherwise. And the problem can be made simpler by, you can actually choose omega to equal zero without loss of generality by going into a rotating frame. Um, theta becomes theta plus omega T. If you substitute that in, the equations stay the same, except it just cancels out the omega. So in this rotating frame, we're really just looking at theta dot equals this 
system. And that turns out to be a gradient dynamical system, meaning you can write down an energy function such that the right-hand side is the gradient of that energy function. And this would be the energy function for an XY magnet on this graph at zero temperature. What that means when you have a gradient system is that all the attractors have to be equilibrium points. You cannot have limit cycles. You can't have strange attractors or tori or anything exotic, uh, no chimera states. The only possible attractors are simple equilibrium points. And so this makes our problem relatively easy to analyze that we can just look for the equilibria, in other words, places where theta dot is equal to zero and try to study their stability and see if we have other attractors besides the, um, the obvious one where all the thetas are equal and everyone's in phase. And so the, the puzzle that I want, because the talk is called, you know, new puzzles and new theorems. The first puzzle is what is the analogous number to the 68% that we found on that special graph with nearest neighbor coupling out to a distance K. Let me pose it this way. Consider an undirected graph with N identical Kuramoto oscillators, but there's a condition on the degree of each oscillator. The graph is dense in the sense that each oscillator is connected to at least mu, some fraction mu between zero and one times n minus one, which is all the other oscillators. So everyone is connected to a fraction mu of the entire graph. I'm not saying it has to be the nearest neighbors, like in the last example, they could be any number, any, any oscillators, as long as you have mu times n minus one or more um, neighbors. Then there is some magic number which I'm going to call the critical value mu sub c, such that if the if you're connected to more than mu sub c of the network, the only attractor is perfect in phase synchrony. No waves, no others possible attractors. So in phase synchrony would be globally stable if mu is above this threshold. If mu is below the threshold, there is some network that supports some other stable state analogous to the rotating wave, but it might be more complicated because we're on an arbitrary graph. So that's the question. What is this magic number mu sub c with this property that above it, all networks would globally synchronize? And so I'm going to tell you what's known. The answer to the question is not known. It's an open problem. Um, we've made some progress on it in the past few years, but it's still a mystery. So let me explain. Um, see how I'm doing here. Good. Okay. Here's what we know. If mu is one, that's global. Everyone's connected to everyone. That's the complete graph. We've known for a long time that system would globally synchronize. In 2012, Richard Taylor in Australia improved this result very much by showing you didn't need a complete graph. If mu is greater than about 94%, that's enough to ensure global synchrony. If every oscillator is connected to at least 94% of the rest of the network in any possible way, could be random, could be deterministic, that's enough to ensure global synchrony. And then the question was, how much could you improve this number? How low could it go? So there was a big breakthrough recently, um, 2019, a group of people from a totally different community these are scientists and mathematicians from the optimization community. They're interested in energy landscapes. And they were thinking about questions, like I mentioned about machine learning, looking for conditions that would have um, no spurious local minima. So that community using techniques from spectral graph theory and um, some really some serious pure math about random matrices and so on, um, good linear algebra, they were able to show that you could shave mu down to 0.79. A little bit later, just now in 2020, two more good mathematicians, Lou and Steinerberger, brought it down slightly to 78.89%. And with my colleagues, Martin Kasaboff and Alex Townsend, we recently uh, published a paper in chaos showing that we could get the number down to 
0.75. We actually think that this number is exactly three quarters. And, and we conjecture that this is, this is the magic number, that above three quarters, these Kuramoto networks will always synchronize in phase. And below that, you can find a network uh, that will have some other possible stable pattern. But that's only a conjecture. We don't know that for a fact. Here's what we do know. Well, actually, before I tell you what we do know, let me give you an idea how these results are obtained. This, I can't show you the details in such a short talk, but this is the strategy. If you have an equilibrium point that's stable, using the Kuramoto dynamics, you can show that the um, equilibrium phases, the thetas, have to satisfy certain trigonometric inequalities that come from the, the equilibrium condition and the stability condition. So you have certain inequalities. Then when you impose this minimum degree condition, that every node has a degree greater than or equal to mu times n minus one, that implies additional inequalities on the first two moments of the distribution of the phases, so-called order parameters, Dido order parameters known in oscillator theory. And so when you combine those sets of inequalities from one and two, if the mu is chosen correctly, you can prove that all the phase differences are confined to half of a circle. That is, no thetas are farther apart than pi from each other. And once you have that, that you've constrained all the thetas to live on a half circle, there's a Lyapunov function argument that shows that the only possible attractor is everyone perfectly in phase. All the thetas have to be equal. So that's the strategy, using these inequalities. And um, it takes some finesse to get the inequalities to show what you want. So that's why there have been several different results, increasingly sophisticated treatment of these inequalities. Okay, now, on the other hand, we know that mu, this critical mu, whatever it is, is greater than or equal to three quarters. On the other hand, we know that we can find counterexamples. We can find networks with other stable states. If mu is less than this number, about 68%, that's what I showed you early on. I said that back in 2006, we had the example of the, um, the nearest neighbor graphs. Everyone connected out to their K nearest neighbors on both sides. Those allowed for traveling waves um, up to a mu of about 68%. Now that number has been improved. People have found other patterns on other kinds of networks, but the number mu has not improved much. It's only gone up. Look how little from 6809 to 6818. And then recently we were able to push it up to 6828. And we believe the best possible result is this one obtained recently, um, 6838. And what I wanna emphasize is how far 68% is from 75%, right? We've got this big gap between our best lower bound and our best upper bound. That's, that's where things are. Uh, before I show you this crazy picture, let me explain that we think that linear stability analysis has gone as far as it can go. That considering eigenvalues, you cannot improve the bounds that I've just told you, the 6838 and the 75%. Um, we think you need some kind of fully nonlinear analysis in the regime in between those two numbers to figure out what the exact mu C is. Um, and so one approach that we've taken is to use algebraic geometry, which allows for nonlinear uh, you know, analysis beyond thinking of eigenvalues. So for, exa for example, here's what we've tried. We, tr we have a strategy where we look at small graphs and then try we're trying to build a counterexample. We're trying to build a graph that has a stable pattern, but is denser than the best known bound. And so we have a strategy for building up these graphs from smaller subgraphs. And we're looking at candidates, but we're ruling out ones that cannot work. For example, those in green cannot work because they globally synchronize. They're trees and all trees are, you can easily prove will globally synchronize. These examples cannot work because they can be made to look like a tree by cutting out one edge and one node on the periphery of the graph. And we can prove that when you prune a graph like that down to a tree, it has the same stability properties as a tree. 
And so it has to be globally synchronizing. These graphs do not work to help us because of an argument that Lee DeVille at Illinois has come up with with center manifold theory. These graphs are too dense to be um, able to support a pattern. And these graphs we could get rid of by algebraic geometry. What I mean is we could actually calculate using algebraic geometry every possible equilibrium point and then check its stability and none of them allow for any patterns other than simple synchrony. So you'll notice that there's three possibilities left, those three. They're interesting in that if you look at what they do, they do support patterns that are not simple synchrony. Um, the first one is just a rotating wave. We already knew about that. The second one is an interesting rotating wave with a twig sticking off. And the third one is a kind of more exotic rotating wave um, with a triangle attached. But unfortunately, all of these are very sparse graphs and they don't help us uh, improve on the best known lower bound. So we're in this situation of having a mysterious gap in our best known bounds. What I'm showing here is the blue dots are the best known mu's for graphs of size up to 50. And now here for graphs up to size 500, you'll notice that these numbers look like they're asymptotically approaching about 0.68. We're not getting anything better than our best known lower bound. And these upper symbols are the best known upper bounds and they asymptotically approach this 0.75. And so there's this enormous gap in here where we really don't know what's going on. Um, so I just wanted to pose this as a puzzle. There is some number in there that is the answer, but I don't know how to find it and no one else does at this point either. So with that said, I'm gonna leave that and just finish my talk with um, one other puzzle where here we do have a bit more understanding. So this is the question of what would happen on a random graph. Um, I've been talking about deterministic graphs so far, but random graphs, of course, are very interesting. And what we're thinking of here is the simplest kind of random graph, the so-called erdos rényi random graph. And um, we're wondering, as you put, so remember how this works, that you've got a random graph, you take a, an ordinary, fully connected, complete graph, and with probability p, you let an edge remain. And with probability one minus P, you delete the edge. And so you choose this parameter P and then a fraction P of the edges in the complete graph remain. That kind of construction is called a, an erdos rényi random graph. And here's what's known about it numerically. If you take parameters N for the number of nodes and P for this probability of having an edge, then in this paper by uh, Ling, Xu, and Bandera from 2019, they did an interesting computer experiment where they looked at, um, let's see what they say. They choose random graphs of size between 5th, 5, and uh, 100. They let the parameter P vary from 0 to 1. And then in this heat map using colors, they, they do 50 independent experiments and ask what fraction of the time does the system find the synchronous state, like it has a global minimum and it finds it. Um, and they see that the, the data seem to fall along some kinds of curves. Now they've put some special curves on here that are known from random graph theory. This curve that is P equals log N over N in red is a famous result actually due to Erdős and Rennie. This is the place where random graphs tend to become connected. Above that probability, there will be no isolated nodes disconnected from the rest of the graph. It's not just that there's a giant component. The whole graph is one component. There are no disconnected nodes. It's all one piece in the large N limit. This is the threshold. So of course, below that threshold, if the graph is disconnected, you're not gonna be able to have global synchrony because the graph is in two pieces. But what they're seeing is that somewhere above that, like here's, two times that threshold for connectivity, two log n over n. Virtually all the uh, simulations go to synchrony. So this led them to a conjecture, as they say, we conjecture in open problem 3.4 in their paper from 2019, that the critical P for synchrony is log n over n. 
Um, and that has been a conjecture now for a few years. In other words, once a random graph becomes connected, it's very likely to become globally synchronizing. Now, they stated a theorem along that direction in their paper, but it wasn't quite what they wanted. Rather than getting log n over n, they have this funny result, log n over n to the one third power with some constants in front. And they showed that the system would be globally synchronizing with a probability very close to one. Don't worry about all this distracting stuff. It's just saying it's uh, very likely to be globally synchronizing once the P reaches this scaling, log n over n to the third. Now that's a somewhat weak result. They thought that the result would be true for smaller values of P than that. And here's what we know today. I just wanna summarize because um, we don't have much time left and I wanna leave time for questions. So here's what's the state of the art. The paper I just mentioned showed that if P is much greater than log N over N to the third, you get globally synchronization, global synchronization of such a graph with a probability that tends to one as n tends to infinity. We were recently able to improve that estimate to something very close to the conjectured best possible result. The conjecture is log n over n. We got within a factor of log n in the numerator of what we think is the best possible result. Um, and that paper was published in chaos earlier this year. And actually we now have a preprint where we collaborated with Bandera and his students. And we have now shown actually that their original conjecture is correct. That as soon as, as soon as P is greater than some constant arbitrarily close to one log N over N. Um, in other words, as soon as the graph has a high probability of becoming connected, it also has a high probability of becoming globally synchronizing. So we think the random graph situation is now pretty well understood, at least for this class of graphs, the erdos rainy random graphs. We do not have results about scale-free networks. Um, there's a lot of interest nowadays in simplicial complexes and other more complicated um, multi-graphs and hypergraphs and things like that that go beyond simple networks. So there's a lot that could be done in this direction for other topologies, and, and we have not done that. So I feel like it's an interesting topic, this question of, of global synchronization on different topologies. And I hope I have um, made you agree with me that it is, it is something worth studying. So the, the approaches that you could use will be spectral graph theory, random matrix theory, and so on, or maybe some techniques that you'll think of on your own. So thanks very much for listening. That's the end. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for this fantastic talk. And uh, I think we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Yes, Boris, please. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Uh, oh, hey. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. And uh, what I would like to ask is a connection uh, of this pure, uh, completely classical problem to quantum ones. Namely, what I suspect is that uh, uh, the models you consider is basically classical analog of tight binding model on the graph. And uh, what I know is that, uh, uh, for example, uh, random regular graph where a number of connections is uh, equal to certain uh, finite number uh, uh, has a gap between ground state and uh, uh, and excited states. And my question is, uh, uh, do you think that existence of, the, of such a gap is actually a property that should be uh, somehow connected with synchronization? <clears throat> That's a wonderful question. I'm afraid I can't give you any kind of good answer because I, I'm not a proper physicist. <laughs> so I don't know enough about the tight binding model or or any of the things that you mentioned to give you an intelligent answer. I, I mean, I trust your instincts that it may be related, but I, I'm afraid I don't know. I, I'm not the right person to answer. Maybe I, someone I should uh, contact you. Maybe we can discuss further. Because okay. I, I feel yes. Some I, I didn't. I didn't know the result that you mentioned about the gap. So that's very suggestive. It's very interesting. 
Okay. I mean, given that this, uh, given, sorry, given that this model is, um, you know, as you can see, when I make the oscillators identical, it is simply related to um, gradient descent on an energy landscape. So it, it's clearly related to these kinds of uh, physics models that you're mentioning. I, I don't know anything about the quantum properties of this. I should say that there are quantum analogs of the Kuramoto model that people have been looking at in recent years. So that could also be an interesting direction. Okay, next question, Dario, please. Yeah, um, the question, I mean, I understand that the question uh, has been, if you want, superseded by the analytical results that you showed later, but can you go back to the numeric, to the first slide on the numerical results? Okay, sure. Excuse me one second. Uh... Well, uh, probably I oh, can I'll, explain I'll, the question sure without, without- Let me find it. So yes. you want, um can you you can see my whole screen right yes do, do you want this one or a different no numeric? the first one the the very the first, first one, one in which you showed the i mean nearest neighbor next to nearest neighbor with yes, yes yeah one. that one okay i mean the question is close to the um, to when you reach one how you i mean i could imagine that maybe if you wait long enough graphs that Look, don't synchronize. Could synchronize if you wait long enough. Oh, so, I see. is there a way to to rule out, rule out the possibility that at long a long time they will synchronize? Again, I know that now this, the question is superseded because you have analytical results on that. But just That's to okay. understand how. Yes. Here, what we yeah. did. It, so maybe this is a good uh, topic for us to discuss a little bit. This paper back in two thousand six was extremely simple, in in that because we had this very symmetrical graph with the nearest neighbor coupling, I mean, the whole graph has a rotational symmetry. You can write down what the alternative attractors would be. They look like these rotating waves. And so we could look at all the candidate attractors, the waves, and do a linear stability analysis on them analytically. And we could calculate this number of 34% because it's when the last wave became unstable. Um, oh, I see. So see, it was not I mean, based on observing the system for no. long times. Well, the, these I are see. simulations, but we could we could explain our simulations by doing a simple linear stability calculation of, of these twisted states, the waves. But I should say that was not a fully rigorous calculation because we never proved that those were the only possible attractors, the waves or a sink. You could imagine mm -hmm. some weird symmetry broken attractor and we wouldn't know how to calculate them or how to look for them. They could conceivably be there, but we didn't, so we didn't rule them out in the, in this paper. Um, okay. But we did, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, there's a question from you, please. Yeah, hi, Steve. Uh, you mentioned shortly uh, the hypergraphs. Uh, I yes. would expect, maybe a completely different behavior because you have quite different topology. Can you talk a bit about? Uh, I, <laughs> I think I have to give you a disappointing answer like I gave to Boris in that I have not studied the hypergraph literature or the simplicial complex literature and have not worked on it myself. Um, I do get the impression from the people who are working on it you know, when I glance at their abstracts, that they are finding new phenomena, really qualitatively new, sometimes counterintuitive phenomena. So I, I'm reluctant to make a guess what would happen. Um, I don't know. I'm not knowledgeable. <laughs> okay. Have I you learned? Yeah, I'm sorry. This is puzzle three or? <laughs> it could be. It could be. Yeah, because there's so much interest now in these new topologies. It seems like many people that are interested in synchronization are working on these more general graphs or hypergraphs. And um, I still find the old problems just on ordinary graphs quite mysterious. So I haven't really caught up to the field. Um, I don't know what would happen. I think I, I want to encourage young people who are listening to this or or old people too you know, try it. I, there's still a lot to be discovered in this in this whole area. Thank you. Uh, there's yeah. a question over there. 
I thanks for the interesting talk. I was I was wondering what is the effect of uh, the the uh, sine function which you took uh, in in terms of all these bounds. Uh, mm -hmm. How how uh, universal are these numbers? That's a great question. Uh, we have not tried other functions, but experience with the Kuramoto model suggests that the sine function is very special. Um, I don't I don't have any reason to think there would be anything universal here. So um, we made a lot of use of trigonometric identities, for example. So so I think the algebraic structure or other special features of the single sine function may be affecting the results. Like maybe so I mean, I could tell you a very simple thing. If you um, go back to the ancient Kuramoto model from 1975, where he looked at the mean field theory. It was a fully connected system with disorder. So the frequencies omega sub i were chosen from a distribution. They had quenched disorder. But um, Kuramoto calculated a, a phase transition that looked like a second order phase transition, like for magnetization. And it had a critical exponent of one half, just like you would expect in a magnetization for a, uh, the, the exponent beta. But, but if you change the sine function to having a second harmonic, that ex critical exponent changed to one from one half. So, so there was, you know, I, I'm just saying, I think the sine function might be special and we okay. definitely made use of some of its properties. So I don't think it's necessarily generic. All right, thank you. More questions? Uh, there's a question. Uh, hello. hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. I just had one naive question. So uh, if the number of connections uh, scale as some other power of n, like square root of n and mm -hmm. things like that, um, is there no way you can achieve synchronization or uh, or uh, or is there anything known about that? Uh, I don't know anything about it. Um, it's a nice question, right? Because why are we doing that particular scaling? I mean, that was how Richard Taylor did it back in 2012. And um, effectively we did it like that with our nearest neighbor. But no, it's a good question. It's interesting to think about other scalings. Um, I don't know. I, I keep answering questions like that. I, you know, <laughs> there there are just many things to be tried. So I, yeah, that's another nice direction to think about. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay. More yeah. questions, maybe Zoomers. Are there any Zoomers who want to ask? Oh, this, uh, wait, first just Zoomers. No Zoomers. Okay, Jungwan, please. Yeah, thank you. I'm wondering how about global synchronization in Directed graph for non normal networks? We never, we haven't studied directed graphs yet. What was your second example? Uh, non normal networks is similar to the graph. Uh, the eigenvectors of the adjacent matrix is not orthogonal case. Oh, did you say non normal matrices? Yes. Yeah, non normal, non symmetric. Okay, right. So, exactly. Yes. So, we, okay a philosophy that I have in research and maybe some of the other people here have different philosophy, but I always try to pick the simplest problem that I don't understand. So if you go to non-normal matrices or to um, directed graphs, you would not have a gradient dynamic anymore. Like I, I use the fact that my time derivative theta dot is the gradient of an energy function. And that lets me be sure that the only attractors are equilibrium points and it makes the problem manageable. If I don't have that structure, then I don't have a gradient flow. And now I'm suddenly dealing with a high dimensional dynamical system on a network. And I don't know, I mean, anything can happen. So I have like no control and I can't prove anything or do anything other than simulations. So I. I mean, might there might be very interesting phenomena and there might be some clever way to use dynamical systems theory to see something or prove something, but I didn't, didn't want to try that because I don't even understand the symmetric case. 
So, so that's the that's the answer. Like, I hope what what the impression people are getting from my unsatisfactory answers <laughs> is <laughs> that um, there's a lot to be discovered. The the field is young, and if you find it interesting, you don't have to worry that it's been done already. I, I don't think it has been done. There's a lot remaining to do. Very natural things to do. Thank you. Okay, maybe uh, we are actually getting close to our break time. But uh, Steve, if I may ask uh, my last or only question here, what happens when you go into this gap between these uh, two bounds, which you showed, and you you take, uh, so to say, a typical network? And can you tell us, is there anything strange or characteristic different from uh, being above or below the upper or the lower bounds in the dynamics of these systems or in, in the types well, yes, of, of I, factors so which, which come there? I, I can tell you this, uh, what we think is happening in there, we're not sure, but I, analytically what we think is happening is that you might have states with um, neutral eigenvalues that are exactly on the imaginary axis. So we, we think, I mean, we've seen some examples. We have one nice example of a network which we thought was going to prove that the magic number was 0.75. And in fact, we did think that for a, a few days, but that, that example had some degenerate eigenvalues that were exactly zero. And um, we hoped that the system might be weakly, you know, like, although the linear, analysis doesn't tell us what's going on. We hope that with a weak nonlinear analysis, we could see and get the result we wanted. But unfortunately, it went the other way. That, that system turned out to be globally synchronizing. We wanted it to be a counterexample of a wave that was stable all the way up to 0.75. So we, we don't know, but we think that there may be more examples of that type in the gap where linear stability analysis fails because of these neutral eigenvalues, but but something subtle and nonlinear is happening. I mean, qualitatively, a lot of the systems seem to to synchronize. We we haven't found any patterns that are stable. If we had, we would be done. I mean, we would have found a new a best a better lower bound, but we haven't seen any. But they might have very small basins of attraction. Okay, uh, I think it's uh, time Thank to you, finish. Sergei. Thank you very much, Steve, for this fantastic presentation. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice for evening and a good night. Okay, thank you. I'm going to listen for some other talks. And we'll have a morning coffee break, please. And good. we meet again at 11 sharp.